Okay, fine. Well, look, my next guest um, is... I, I just want to look at which... Um, well, you can tell us anyway, can't you? But I can't... See it's, the printing's so small. Um, uh, anyway, I'm with Dr. Rima Makarem. Is that, is that, you, is that how you pronounce it? That will be it? fine, yeah. Makarem, okay, fine. Uh, and th I've been looking forward to this, really, because it's a conversation about ICBs, who are the latest kid on the block. Um, none of us, I think, really understand them. Um, most of us have a, a sort of view of trepidation, I think, uh, about where they are and what they're going to do. And, and so we've got the chairman of one here who, who's going to tell us all about it. But before we do, what, what is your background? Are you a medical doctor? No, I've got a PhD in biochemistry. Yeah. Um, did the PhD, did the postdoc, then went into management consultancy, then I went into pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Um, and then after pharmaceuticals, I fell into the whole non-exec world. So I've been a non-exec, audit chair, and now chair in the NHS predominantly for about 16, 17 years. What, what, attract, what, what brought you in? I mean, I, it's my background as well, but it's how, did you, <laughs> how did you stumble into it? I stumbled into it because I was on the global talent list um, at my pharmaceutical company, um, and they thought the best use of my skills at a certain point was to be a sales rep. And I refused to be a sales rep. Um, it wasn't in my DNA, and if I'd wanted to do it, I would have done it 10 years previously and I had two children under the age of two, so I decided I was gonna be a full-time mother. That lasted six or seven months, and then I heard about these things called non-execs. Yeah. And I've always been interested in the whole healthcare world, um, making a difference to patients, and actually, as I entered the world, realized what a complex, intellectually challenging world it is, and how, even if I could only make a small difference, it still helped the journey for the NHS, which, as we saw earlier, has gone through multiple um, restructuring, each time with an aim to do something better and bigger. Um, and so I've had the opportunity to do commissioning, to be at a big London hospital. Um, I've been on a Let Be, which was one of the offices of Health Education England. Uh, I've been at a medical school council um, uh, board. Um, I've done practically everything except for mental health. So you're a glutton for punishment? I am. Right. <laughs> Okay, what, let, well, let's get, so, uh, interesting background. I mean, I came in via business, and, you know, I thought I knew everything about running everything when I arrived in the NHS, and then it, it took me about 15 minutes to realise that, that I, there was nothing in my life's experience <laughs> that equipped me at all to do anything in the NHS. It, 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 what, what took me by surprise w was the sheer volume of everything. I mean, everything, yeah. every number. I mean, you, you can talk, uh, you know, cardiothoracic operations to bog rolls, whatever it is, it's a big number. Yep. And that's a big big issue. I mean, and when little things go wrong, they're, they're always big things yep. in the end. Yeah, absolutely. And um, But there are lots of things you can bring from the business world into the NHS because a lot of people are homegrown in the NHS. So bringing, as a non-exec, experience from elsewhere makes a difference. So I remember going around this very large London hospital trust, and every ward had its own stockroom. You would never do that in the private sector because the amount of um, money, in effect, yeah. tied up in that stock, sure. as well as using up all these rooms that could be turned into clinical rooms made no sense. Then it turned out it's because we needed a procurement system put in, yeah. which we did do over two or three years. But it was because I'd gone round on that little wander around the hospital that it suddenly occurred to me Whereas in the NHS, it's an accepted fact. Yeah, uh, you are right. I mean, there's a great book by Tom Peters called In Pursuit of Excellence. I don't know if you, any of you have read it, but if you're into management, read Tom's book. Um, and he talks about management by walking around. Uh, and, you, and, and I have to confess that you talk about procurement and the amount of uh, money that's tied up dead stock in it. The, the real cause of dead stock in the NHS in my day was sisters' drawers, because mm. sisters on the wards always kept back a supply of <laughs> some stuff or other that they knew they'd run out of. And so we, you know, we had about 10 million quids worth of stuff tied up in sisters' drawers on their desk on the ward. And it was quite interesting, because I used to be the, the chairman of the National Standing Committee on Supplies and Purchasing. Right. And I'm pleased to tell you that uh, when I did it, it was a complete mess. 
um, and I'm re reliably informed it's got no better since. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel too bad about making a mess of it. <laughs> right, so so when you first came in, we, we, did we have primary care trusts then? Yes, that so I joined a primary you, care you, trust. You saw the, the, the PCTs. Yep. The idea of the primary care trust was, of course, that a doctor uh, with a, uh, a stethoscope and a checkbook uh, was more valuable than a doctor that was just a stethoscope. But it didn't kind of work, did it, really? Uh, they I, I think PCTs were getting there. I think the problem is that every time there's a restructure, people think it's going to change everything overnight. It never does. And it, it never does. No. And so every 10 years, just as whatever was put in is really starting to make a difference, they go and restructure and yeah. you start all over again. And so I think, w at least in London, with a clustering of PCTs, so they went from the 32 PCTs down to five, um, and that made a huge difference in terms of effectively a little bit what we're doing at integrated care systems, which is looking at the whole locality, looking at the whole health economy, um, rather than just certain silos within the NHS, so primary care, divor you know, without looking at the secondary care. Um, so I, I think it, they were dismantled just when they were starting to work. Yeah, it, it, we never give things time. To, to bed in and, yeah. and new organizations because anything you ever read about the management of change there's always the bedding in time uh, you know Roger's diffusion theory of change you know all of that he makes it very clear bedding in is important but we don't do it we just say it's all going to start on the 1st of April because that's when the financial year starts yeah so y you saw the death <laughs> of primary care trusts yep. and then we had CCGs yep. where the theory was a doctor with a checkbook and a stethoscope was more valuable than a doctor with a stethoscope alone. And, and that didn't really work either, did it? The, the, the doc, that, I, I think, think the, the doc started with some enthusiasm, but when they sort of saw how difficult it was and they got as busy as they are, they just kind of gave up. The, the difference between the CCGs and the PCTs is the PCTs were run by managers, which I always vilified, but actually are people trained up to run organizations. And the CCGs were predominantly run by GPs. The pro was that they started to understand how much it cost to just keep referring people into hospital yeah. without giving it a second thought. But the downside was that they weren't necessarily trained up in running very complex organizations. Exactly. Uh, and I've always felt, you know, as a lifelong manager, it was my job to create the time and space for good people to do great things. And, and that's our job in hospitals, it's our job in primary care, it's our job everywhere to create the environment where doctors can be great doctors. Yeah. Uh, but, and I, and, uh, but it was interesting, if you go, I mean, I go back to the Griffiths report, where Griffiths, um, this, this predates Thatcher and most people in this room, but I mean, he, he, he said he wanted, if, if for Florence Nightingale wanted the corridors of the NHS with her lamp, she, she couldn't figure, she could never figure out who was in charge. And she was right, because the docs ran everything in hospitals, and then that's all changed. So, uh, so that then brings us up to where we are now. So uh, if integrated care boards or integrated care groups, or however you describe them, are not CCGs and they're not PCTs, what are they going to do that's better? Okay, so let's start with population health. If you look at any one individual, 20% of health and well-being is determined by access to health care and the quality of that health care. And that's the NHS bit. The 80% is governed by access to good education, to good jobs, to good housing, green spaces, lifestyle behaviors. None of that is in the control of the NHS. So the big hope, and it's happening globally, so it's, we're actually laggards in this. It's not like we've invented something new is that we bring all of these different groups together to integrate health and care, to make that big difference for the individual in holistically. So fixing the NHS won't fix the population's health. It make life a lot easier to go and see your GP and get off that waiting list for your operations. It won't fix the community's overall health. It won't necessarily help with health inequalities. So we really do need to make these things work, but they are, if we thought the NHS was complex, it's very difficult to get very different systems, so local authorities work to very different 
funding arrangements and different masters to the NHS. In our patch, we've also got over 4,000 volunte uh, voluntary charitable and social enterprise organizations, all of which do fantastic work that we need to bring into our whole agenda. And of course, our 1.1 million people also have a view as to what would make a difference to their lives. But if we focus on the resident and their, their whole life, rather than just can they see their GP tomorrow, that's where we start to make a difference. And, and this is not the first time we've done it, because I go back to district health authorities, uh, and I was the chairman of a district health authority, and around that table, we had GPs, we had uh, local authorities, we had the schools, we had the fire brigade, we had the police, we had to get a bigger table, you know, because everybody was sitting around the table. And I remember it very well. It was a disaster, really, then, because we, we, th this, these were the days, if you can imagine it, before Microsoft spreadsheets, uh, and we had graph paper to, to do the, the numbers on, and it was in the days before photocopiers, and we had Roneos, and it was in the days before we really got a handle on the money, and we could really tell where the resources was going. I mean, resource allocation for us was to divide the amount of money we got at the beginning of the year by 12, um, and that was resource allocation. But that was the, I, I could see then, the, this is the reason why I'm a big fan of ICV, well, I, I want to be a big fan of ICV, is that I, I saw then what we could do if you could get everyone working together. But as you say, they are all marched to a different tune, they're all funded differently, as we learned this morning, none of the IT systems speak to each other. Is it, I mean, we got rid of district health authorities because the thinking was, well, we should just focus on the stuff that we do. The NHS should focus on running hospitals and primary care and everybody else does their bit and it will all fit in together. And that's why we got rid of district health authorities. Do you, I mean, I, this is a difficult question for you to answer. Uh, Rima, and if you want to duck it, I'll understand. But I mean, do you think the do you think the task is just too big to do this in one step? Should we have said, well, we'll integrate with the local authorities first, and then we'll integrate with education? And because I mean, they can't do it in Whitehall, what makes you think you can do it in Milton Keynes? So if you if I had been in charge, I'd have integrated the NHS first because we've got the silos between physical health and mental health and primary care, secondary, tertiary. I mean, you've got all the different silos. I would have tried to integrate that first, then bring in social care. So it's been a very big journey for me personally for the last three years, coming into a system that covers Bedfordshire, Luton, Milton Keynes, where it was a first wave ICS. Um, but what that meant on the ground, and they'll kill me for saying this, was that they would meet quarterly, argue about theoretical governance for a couple of hours, and then hope the whole thing would be dissolved before they had to meet before the next quarter. If you walk in today, you would not recognize it. So our fo four local authorities uh, are unitary, so that's lucky for me, so I've got district and, and county councils to deal with, but they span the political spectrum and they don't t talk to each other and they don't work together. Or at least they didn't. Um, and suddenly they're starting to realize that they can achieve more together. We're one of the fastest growing patches in the country, so there's infrastructure to be built. They need to do things together. They have just set up a joint overview and scrutiny committee, which it would have been unheard of three years ago. Um, I don't think it's a difficult- Does everyone know what an overview and scrutiny committee is? They're, they're the group of people where the, the NHS, if it wants to make substantial changes to the way it delivers care, you have to persuade the overview and, and scrutiny committee. And they're very powerful people. And yeah. they, all, they usually say no first. <laughs> and then you, can, you spend the next six months trying to make them say yes. But, but a joint health and local government overview and scrutiny committee is a huge step forward in managing change. Yeah. Um, and if you walked into our board, so I think NHS England was a bit uncomfortable at first, but I explained to them we were going to have a large board because it had taken me two years to get people to want to be at the table. I wasn't going to ask them to walk away. Um, so we have a very big board, but we're still in development. Um, they're still too polite and not really arguing what they want to say. But the amount of work that's now going on, the amount of things that people want to do, 
I'm now at the point of saying that's great, but we can't do everything on day one because if we have 50 projects, we're not going to deliver on any of them. Whereas if we have a handful of meaningful projects that we see through to the end, let's see if we make that impact. Okay, I've got, I've got an eye on the time because we, we've only got about 10 minutes left. Uh, so tell me, uh, here you are, you've, you're all sitting around the table, you've all just discovered where the toilets are and where you can park your car, and it, was, it all goes from there. What, what are your priorities and how are you prioritizing? Okay, so we came up, well, it had to be around the resident. It, it isn't about the NHS, though it is about the NHS, but that's part of the resident. And we're spanning the life cycle. So children starting well, for example, is our first objective. That it, in NHS terms would be maternity services, immunization, mental health for children, young people. But when you look at it from the context of an ICS, you then start to talk, to, talk about nursery provision, access to playgrounds, uh, opportunities for work later on, getting them school ready. So in fact, we've just had a seminar involving all the experts in the area looking at how do we get children to be school ready and help them on their development journey so that by the time they hit 10, which is when we start looking at children who are eligible for SEND packages, if we've helped them with their development before 10, we're hoping to reduce the number of children who need SEND packages and we're hoping to reduce the size of those packages. Right, so that is that the priority? I mean, the word priority means the most important thing. Um, and the NHS cleverly has nine priorities, uh, which is bonkers. Yeah. So I'm, I'm coming back on that question. What is your priority? So within that, there will be sub-priorities. So it means that we have to get mental health right for our children, Right. Um, so, for example. So, yeah, let me rephrase it. So what is your main focus on the kids? That's a very long range thing. Yep. Uh, huge, you know, schools seem to be taking over parenting these days. You drop your yep. kids off for breakfast, they have lunch, they have after school clubs, they're there at the weekends because mum and dad are all busy working for Amazon or whatever yep. it is they're yep. doing. Yep, and then we've got the VCSE coming in to help with certain aspects of that. So did, are, are you focusing on, on kids, which is a, a long payback time, well beyond the Parliament, uh, because you see that it, that's where the savings are? I mean, what, 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 so what drove that focus? So we do actually look at other parts. It's not our only focus, but if I took children, because that's the bit that we're all passionate about, whereas everybody else is, the other priorities we have to do. Um, Actually, the payback's not that long. So if, we, if a kid is going into school at three or four, we'll know that they need a SEND package but within five years. And the thing that's busting everybody's budgets, particularly local authorities, are children with SEND packages and looked after children. So they're all on board, because if we do the right thing by those children, not only do we do the right thing for those children and we set them on the right course in life, but you also have that halo effect so if these children are falling between the gaps, for example, going through the NHS system, if we fix it for them, we've then fixed it for everyone. So getting everybody to focus on a cohort rather than trying to fix everything, which is obviously what they say nationally and give us new priorities every time, then we'll just never get there. But if you focus on a few cohorts and the promise for them, okay. you fix it. Uh, uh, and in, in my experience, uh, you, you know, everyone says they're going to work together until it comes to the budget, and then everybody's trying to shift the budget from <laughs> the health to local authorities or pass the parcel with the money. You, you have these, what, it's Section 75, the Better Care Fund. Um, it, it, it just for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, when Parliament votes money to local government, it can only be spent on local government, and it votes money to the NHS, it can only be used on the NHS, and, and so it is all right across the public sector. The, the Section 75 of the Finance Act, it, it's created something called the Better Care Fund, and local government can lob money in the fund along with the NHS, and uh, uh, pretty much anybody really can lob their money in, and then it can be used for a shared and agreed health per, uh, in its broadest sense purpose. I mean, you, I, I suppose the answer is that there are limits to the size of the Better Care Fund. Is that enough for you to do what you want to do? 
So we have four places which we make coterminous with our councils. The dem demographics for each of the four are very different. They set their local priorities um, and the Better Care Fund is reviewed at place and then at the board. Is it covering everything? No, but at the same time, as I said before, you can't do everything for that population in one year. The other, there's another one, section 256. They're all numbers to me, but this is another way of uh, the NHS giving grants to local authorities. So for example, last year, we knew we weren't gonna get any money for winter discharge for this year. We had some money left over, which we were able to give to the local authorities to support winter discharge for this year. Um, so there are things that we can do together. Well, it, uh, sorry to cut you short, I'm just thinking about the time. Uh, it's interesting that your primary focus is, is the longitudinal focus is, is with kids, given the real problem that we've got is at the other end of life, isn't it? It's local, go local government's inability to really to, uh, to get the care packages together. I read uh, yesterday, I think, there are 436,000 people in the country waiting longer than six weeks for a care package. Yeah. Uh, I is that not a priority? It is. So I've only covered children. We do have one, another priority called living well, which is about keeping people well, or if they've got chronic conditions, helping them manage those conditions. We have one called aging well, because it's not just about the uh, life expectancy gap, but it's also the number of years spent in good health um, towards the end of people's lives. So we have got lots of work going on there. We've done lots of work with our care homes, had various successes, which has seen a real difference and reduction in the number of people can, uh, who are sent to hospital from those care homes. Um, we've done a lot of work around the elderly. My personal view, which isn't shared by all, is that I think we possibly do too much for our elderly rather than keeping them as comfortable and as well as possible. You know, I come across anecdotes of the 90-year-old who goes to hospital for a, a broken hip, they discover they've got a murmur, heart murmur, can we do a heart bypass on a 90-year-old? You know, we just need to stop at some point and just give them as good quality of life well, as it, possible. Well, it's the uh, uh, equality of uh, treatment under the, the NHS Charter. It's, it's the law, really, that hospitals have to offer treatment to people once they discover that they've got something that needs treating. So we'd have to change the law about that. I, this is um, an IT conference, right? Yep. So let's talk a bit about uh, IT. I mean, I, I'll ask you the same question that I asked uh, one of the panelists this morning. It just, he thought he was escaping, I, I grabbed him. <laughs> um, do you know what you want in this whole IT agenda? I think we do for the short term. The short term, um, as Mark was referring to earlier, we have Milton Keynes that even as a city is streets ahead of most places in the country. They've got little robots running around the hospital as well as in the streets doing all sorts of wonderful things. But in Bedfordshire, they're not as advanced. So we are trying to support Milton Keynes to carry on advancing, but trying to rapidly help Bedfordshire catch up, join Milton Keynes to Bedfordshire, join hospital to the GPs, to the pharmacists. So we have that one patient record. Because if we say to people, don't show up at your GP for minor ailments, you can go to your pharmacist. And if the pharmacist can't see their records, or if the GP can't see what the pharmacist did, mm. it's a problem. Um, so it's the, it's the lifelong problem of interoperability, interoperability. or the mutualization of access. The other thing that we're doing is we're building a, an institute for public health or population health. Um, and that will pull in all the available data, including census data. Well, this is the federated data platform. Yeah. Uh, you're doing it yourself. So we're already doing it. Well, I mean, the NHS has spent £338 million pounds on this, and you're not the only person that's doing this. I mean, there are loads of organisations who are doing their own thing on the analysis of data, and I don't know who the hell is ever going to use the Palantir system. Well, we're doing it with the directors of public health, so with yeah. the local authorities. The police want to give us their data, the fire brigades want to give us their data, because if we can triangulate and spot vulnerable families, families about to tri tip into crisis, and all the different agencies can step in to support them. I absolutely get it. It makes a huge yeah, difference. It, it does. Look, uh, we're against the buffers of time, and I got uh, sidetracked there, really. Uh, has anybody got any quick questions you might like to ask? Please do if you've, you've got the boss of one of these new kids on the block. You could try and figure out. Are you, let me ask you a final question. Are you open to innovation? I mean, this conference is about innovation. 
The NHS doesn't have a single front door. It's got 40 front doors for the ICBs. It's got 250 front doors for hospitals. It's got 8,000 front doors for doctors. How are you managing innovation um, or being receptive to innovation? So we're very receptive. I'm trying to set it up as a research and innovation ICS. Um, and we have uh, an R&I board and we have um, a research hub. Um, so definitely set up for it. The problem that I've got is that people come and send me emails. Here's a little widget for this tiny bit on this pathway. One, I'm the wrong person to talk to about it. And it's only a tiny part of one pathway when we're looking at that big picture. Um, I'm particularly interested... Do you have an IT strategy? We have an IT digital strategy. Yeah. Um, but like all the strategies, the ICSs are only a year old. So they're almost quick and dirty strategies of what we know today while they're being worked up in more detail. Um, so the, the primary thing at the moment is have we got the right foundations in place in terms of that interoperability, connectivity, digitization, because without that, if we haven't got the right data going in, how do we add all the other stuff onto it? So it's going to be a multi-year process, which doesn't mean that we don't want to do innovation. We've done innovation. We've put razor chairs, for example, in all our care homes, which effectively allows you to put the chair around the person who's fallen on the ground. They don't go to hospital. They're looked after. They're picked up really easily. They don't spend hours on the ground. We've got wearable data that's going in. We've got various apps that are supporting parents with very severely epileptic kids. Um, and that allows them to go on holiday because they have direct contact with their consultants back home. So there's a lot of innovation going on. But as somebody said earlier, there are 5,000 companies out there all trying to sell. Um, and we can't put 5,000 innovations in. No, it's, we've got hammers looking to nose. Could you be very quick, sir, because I'm out of time? Go on. Twelve point five percent of nursing time is spent looking for stuff, which is awful if it's your lunch break. We chip can, and pin. Well, we give more of an RDF chip. I yeah, chip and pin. Done. Yeah. It's all out there. Yeah. Solves your recruitment problem. Well, it, 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 it helps certainly it. helps. No, yeah. I, I agree. And there's a hospital I went to that's got RDF. Uh, who, where is it? It's not Milton Keynes. It's somewhere else. I think somewhere in Liverpool that have got RDF. They've RDF'd all their kit as well, because one of the other problems is finding where the kit is. Yes. The Listen, real, I could talk to you all day. I'm so sorry. We've run out of time. That, did you find that interesting? I thought it was interesting. Can we have a round of applause for everyone? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.